Welcome back to Traveling Dice. This is Jason. I have a terrain build for you in today's video, which is focusing on the Altar of Cain, which is found in the Warhammer Fantasy 8th Edition rulebook. It's one of the mysterious monuments. And I came across this packaging material uh, after the Christmas gifts had been exchanged at my house. And yeah, sometimes I find that this packaging material looks really promising in terms of just turning some trash into some interesting terrain. Nevertheless, I I saw that one portion of the packaging material and it just kind of looked altery to me. And I thought I could add a few things to it just to kind of finish it off. And I just cut it out and removed uh, a bunch of portions. And then I'm using as that basic material just some chipboard, which I I traced the initial altar piece onto the chipboard and then used the jigsaw to cut it out and a sander just to bevel the edges. Now I did notice that when I cut out the altar um, kind of base portion for this build that it wasn't quite sitting flush and it was kind of sitting at an odd angle. So the only reason I'm adding the cardboard at the bottom is just to kind of bring it up to what looks like a more level height. So these cardboard pieces that I'm cutting out here, I'm just going to use essentially as shims underneath the piece to get it to sit in a, a proper way. And I know I'm going to cover them up, so I'm not too worried about them being visible, although I don't really want them to stick out greatly. Once I have the initial base of the build here glued onto the actual chipboard base, I then go and start to fill in that center area. It's very hollow, it's very shallow. And that is gonna be kind of the focal point of the altar and the, the rest of the structure is gonna kind of build up to that and then it's gonna have kind of a recess down. I do like that recess, but I don't want it to be quite so sharp. I cut out a cardboard piece that will fit in there. Once I see that it's gonna fit well, I use that as a template to cut other pieces. And I'm simply just gluing in layers of that cardboard until I feel like it's the appropriate height. I put a fair bit of effort into making sure that the last layer of cardboard going into that actual altar portion is sitting in there as flush as possible with as few gaps as possible. I know that I'm gonna be filling that in and have other material added onto it and I don't really want it to fall in any gaps that might exist. Uh, so I add that piece in and glue it down. So I give all the glue a chance to dry here. When I'm putting this particular piece together at this stage or leading up to this stage, I've used a combination of hot glue for certain areas and then PVA glue uh, for certain areas. So the PVA glue does take a little bit of time to dry. And at this point, I realized that I made a slight error, that my chipboard base uh, in the front should have some extra room because I intended to have a little ramp section leading up to the altar. So that's not great. It's hard to rebase it. It's hard to make that chipboard base bigger. I suppose I just could cut another base and then have like a multiple elevation thing, but that's kind of more work than I want to do to solve this problem. So I, I cut out a section and I decide I'm just going to kind of make the ramp further back. I think it actually ends up working out okay, but in my mind initially, I thought the ramp would be out in front, which is just no room to add it. So that's the reason I'm cutting into this thing and then I'm just going to kind of sculpt the ramp leading up to it. Initially, I thought too, I might create some foam stairs instead of the ramp but I started doing that and um it wasn't looking great in my mind and it was it was kind of difficult and I thought okay well the ramp will be a lot easier and it might look better so to make the ramp and any other areas that I need to kind of fill in I'm going to use this product called sculpt a mold I purchased it on Amazon it's not particularly cheap but uh, I do find that a bag lasts a, a fair time and all, all I do is add water to it to get it to be about the consistency of, of oatmeal here. And I'm going to use it here to fill in the altar portion and, and try to make it look a little stony because I just had the cardboard there. I'm going to use it to build up the ramp and then really just fill in any slight gaps that exist where the piece makes the base. So I'm just working that into place. Um, I... Knowing that I'm going to use my finger here, I do put on a 
on a glove, but, um, yeah, I don't know. This substance might dry out your hands a little bit if it's on there for a while. And oftentimes I don't wear gloves, but, um, I don't know. In this instance, it seemed to make the most sense because I knew certain sections of this I was going to have to uh, sculpt with my finger. The sculpt mold does take about 12 to 24 hours to dry, and I think that depends on a few variables. So how much water you add to it, you know, how, how liquidy of a consistency are you working with, um, the weather conditions, the temperature, wherever it's sitting and drying, a warmer temperature is going to yield you a faster drying time. Um, so it has a few factors, but I find that generally within 24 hours, uh, it's completely dry. And it also dries and it's, it's pretty durable. It's pretty sturdy. It's pretty hard. So I do like the fact that it's, it's workable. Um, and yeah, it can really kind of take any shape here. Um, the dry time is a factor. So if you're trying to, um, finish a piece quickly and move on, it's probably not the best, but if you're like me and kind of carve out just a few minutes to work on something and come back to it later or the next day, it's, it's really ideal. Once the sculptor mold is dry, I'm going to go ahead and add a layer of sand uh, around the base. Um, I'm going to try to make this kind of look like soil. So I put down uh, a fairly generous layer of PVA and then just dump the sand right on top all around the base, let it dry, and then I hit it with uh, a little bit of a Mod Podge coat just to kind of seal it in. It does take several hours for the PVA to dry. I do find that the sand kind of absorbs it and tends to speed up that drying process. But I do give this um, definitely several hours before I tinker with it at all. So I do feel like at this point, it's kind of missing something, which is like some flames, some torches, um, some little statue pieces on some of the more pillory sections. And I have a little collection of some of these bits, which are from the Reaper Bones line. And they're, they're kind of like little pedestals, little torches, little flames. And I go into that arsenal. Uh, I got them from one of the Kickstarters. I would think by now they're probably available on the Reaper website. But this kind of thing you can probably find in your bits box or the torches potentially you could make or sculpt if you wanted to add something like this. But just around the altar area, I'm adding in three torches and then kind of flanking the, the ramp leading up. I'm just adding in two skulls, which I think I'm gonna end up painting gold. I use super glue to glue these particular pieces down. Since I'm not gluing them to foam, I know the super glue is safe to use. The super glue that I've traditionally used, honestly, just because it's the first super glue I ever got and kind of liked it and never really deviated from it is a Zappa Gap. Uh, and I generally purchase it on Amazon. All right, so you do notice that there's some paint on it. I did want to prime those bones, torches, and skull statues because I just feel like they're going to be easier to paint. I've I heard some people say you don't have to prime the bones models. I always do. Um, I don't know if it's, I'm just a creature of habit here. I've never really tested the, you don't have to prime the bone stuff, but I don't know, your mileage may vary. So at this point, I'm cutting the actual center uh, altar structure. I want to have like this platform for, you know, sacrifices or things of that nature. And that's going to be cut out of the piece of the pink XPS foam. And I'm just kind of testing it and seeing how it fits there. I'm going for kind of a general ovally kind of shape and after I get what I feel like is kind of an appropriate shape for the piece I just texture it I think I end up using a rock and just kind of mashing it in there to try to create that stony um, texture to glue this foam piece down I simply use Eileen's tacky glue it's kind of like a thicker PVA and I glue it in place you could certainly use hot glue especially if you wanted to immediately move on but I was gonna let that sit for a while and what would a Warhammer piece be without some extra skulls? I go to my Citadel box of skulls. This is actually a really cool kit for bits. And you get just, as advertised, just a ton of skulls. So I get the skulls um, primed. I end up just taping them to um, a little piece of cardboard because I want to kind of paint the rocky areas separately and then glue the skulls on already painted. 
which we're kind of at that stage, which is awesome. Um, and ironically, though, um, painting is kind of my, my least fun stage of terrain building. I don't know why. It feels like when I'm building it, I can see the progress a lot faster than um, painting it. Uh, nevertheless, I do an initial coat here of the mixture of black paint uh, with Mod Podge. It may not be as critical on a piece that's mostly foam. The um, black paint and Mod Podge can kind of stiffen up and, and strengthen your um, foam from the pink XPS foam portions of any project. And this is a trick definitely picked up by Black Magic Craft. If you're not familiar with that channel, go check it out. It's awesome. All right, generally I let that Mod Podge uh, black paint mixture dry for probably an hour or two, and then I go on to painting. So for the stony portions, I tend to just go with gray. I do three um, colors of gray, kind of progressively lighter, starting with a dark gray. And then also I try to dry brush these on in a way where each layer is getting kind of progressively thinner and, and lighter and kind of more just focusing on the edge uh, edges of the piece. When it comes to painting stone in this style, I do immediately move on from one color to the next. So although when you're dry brushing, it doesn't particularly take the acrylic paint a long time to dry, I find that uh, just immediately moving on kind of gives me a little bit of a blending effect. The other thing that I don't do while doing this is clean out my brush. So the other thing that I think gives you a little bit of a blend is just kind of having a natural mixture of one color to the next in, in areas of the dry brushing. So same brush, don't clean it out, and I immediately go from one color to the next. And yeah, I find that the result is pretty good. On the skulls, I do paint these separately, and I paint them directly on that cardboard piece, which I prime them on. And I know that the, the portion that I'm not able to paint because they're taped down is the portion that I'm going to glue to the terrain piece. So I'm not that bothered about one side not really getting the paint. Oftentimes on horns and bones, I'll do kind of a brownish look, and I start with a burnt umber and either do a dry brush or just a, a paint on highlight, uh, working my way up to a ivory color or sometimes a light ivory color, depending upon the piece. I think this I actually hit with a, a slight highlight of the light ivory, but I'm going through this process fairly quickly. It's nice that they're not glued in place because if they were glued in place, I'd have to go a lot slower on this particular step. So now I go and paint the soil portions around the actual terrain piece and I'm using burnt umber and I'm actually just using my piece kind of as the palette here. I don't always do stuff like this, but uh, every once in a while it seems kind of convenient and I just kind of put a big pile of paint on one section and just kind of keep going back to it and extracting paint from it. Uh, you run the risk of just having too much paint on the piece and then you have to somehow get it off, but... I felt pretty confident I knew about how much paint I needed. And I, I really wanted to put it on in a fairly thick fashion anyways and get really good coverage. Uh, so it, it ends up working out. I do a layer of this burnt umber. And then after that dries, I do typically let the soil base coat dry. I just dry brush on a territorial beige uh, color as a highlight. Now it's time to glue those skulls into place. So I do use uh, my Zappa Gap super glue here, and this bottle is kind of almost empty, and I've had to cut back the tip a few times, so it's not really as precise of a, of a glue as I would like. It, it comes with this really fine tip, and then I find that over time it crusts over and I have to cut it back. So, you know, ideally you'd probably be using something like tweezers for this, and you do run the risk of getting a little glue on your fingers. Um, but I can't find my tweezers, so I just kind of roll with it. Uh, I end up doing okay here. All I'm really doing is kind of placing them in the crevice, um, really along the perimeter around that center altar structure, and then I put one in there right by the altar itself. And at this point, we're kind of coming down the home stretch. I start painting the little skull statues uh, along the ramp, and I'm doing these with some 
darker uh, gold colors. I always find gold on black takes several layers, it seems, at least for me, for the paint that I'm using. So I do a few layers of that. I do go back on that portion and add in the, I think it's called the sepia wash. I'm a big fan of the Games Workshop washes. I don't generally use their paints. But I find that their washes are uh, a really good tool for getting certain effects. So the sepia wash, I end up going back and, and hitting the gold with that and then doing a few highlights. The braziers, I just hit with a, a bronze kind of a color and then go back and, and hit those with the sepia wash as well. And then the actual flame portions. I know that the flames, uh, in theory, you it's the opposite of a lot of other highlighting where you have the lighter colors in the recesses and the darker colors up front. I don't know. I find that it just looks odd to me. So for the flames, I just add a series of oranges going from a, a really dark to a really light. And then I also apply a, kind of an orange color wash. Um, it's a really old wash. I don't even know if it's available anymore, but I'm sure Games Workshop has um, a newer version of it. Uh, so yeah, that's the flame portions there. And then I go and I add some uh, flocking around the base, like there's little patches of uh, grass or moss going around. I'm, I'm pretty liberal with this, but it depends on the, on the piece itself. Uh, at that point, I then do two coats on my pieces. I find that the uh, tester's uh, lacquer gloss coat uh, doesn't actually mess with the foam in my experience. Uh, again, your mileage may vary. So I do a layer of the gloss and then I hit it with the uh, Citadel um, matte varnish. And I also find that that's pretty foam friendly. You definitely want to do some test pieces though anytime you're spraying directly onto foam. And unfortunately, the Citadel matte varnish is not cheap. Actually, neither is the testers, but I don't know. I find that those give me decent results. Uh, so those are the finishes that I typically go with. Oftentimes when applying this flocking, I just use super glue. I've used PVA as well. I think the PVA works um, fine. I just find that the super glue seems to hold it better. I, and I feel like sometimes when I use the PVA, it ends up kind of flaking off um, after the project's done a little bit, which is probably not the end of the world. So I've used both. I think either is fine. Um, but I seem to have better luck with the super glue. All right, so the very last thing I'm going to do here is try to do like a blood effect on the altar portion itself. And I'm using a combination of the glossy Mod Podge with some red paint. Now, in retrospect, I wish I had made this mixture darker. I don't think that the red was quite dark enough. And then I think also maybe in retrospect, I would have used this effect a little more sparingly. Um, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm overall happy with the result, but I think a darker color might look better and then just, yeah, probably don't get too carried away like me. But nevertheless, I think it adds a little spa splash of color. Uh, otherwise, you know, sometimes you run the risk of this just looking like a big gray kind of a, a blob. When everything is said and done, this is my final result. Uh, although I might have gone a, a little less crazy with the blood effect, I'm declaring this a success and this is ready for the tabletop. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did and you know someone that might also enjoy the content, please share it with them. Bye for now.